how to run a digital classroom, where we will be covering the seven elements of digital learning. You know, it's interesting, one of the most common questions we are getting these days is what will technical education look like in the fall? Will our students be studying at home or will they be on campus in classrooms? Will they be doing virtual skills on their labs at home or will they be in physical labs doing hands-on skills? And what about those labs? It used to be that we could have three or four students sitting around a piece of equipment and learning together. It's unlikely that that will be the case this September. So what are we to do? At Lab Midwest, we have all of the same questions that you have. We have questions about what our students will do, be doing and what our labs will look like. But we do know two things relatively for certain. The first one is that there's a very good chance that our students will be back on campus in some form when we get to fall. But number two, we know that those campuses will not look a lot like what they did in March when our students left them. So our job and the job of our customers is to equip themselves with all seven elements of digital learning so that no matter what happens, we will be prepared. At ATS Lab Midwest, our job is to secure the American dream. That is our mission for the next generation of talent in advanced manufacturing and in STEM. And so that makes it our job to work with our partners, to work with our customers, to work with our clients, to work with all of our partners, to make sure that they are adequately prepared with all seven elements that you will be seeing today. Now, as we begin, I have a confession to make. And that confession is this. As we were putting together this webinar, we were tempted to make this a video, to record it ahead of time with multiple takes, editing out all of our mistakes and making it absolutely perfect. Well, the truth is that we always try to do the right thing and that didn't seem like the right thing. When our customers and our clients, when our professors and our teachers and our instructors get to their classrooms this fall, they will not have the luxury of do-overs. They'll have to get it right the first time. So we are going to do the same thing. Everything you see today is 100% real. With the exception of a very, very short video, everything is live. Everything is 100% authentic because that is the way that your classrooms will look like when we get to fall. And now let's dive in to those seven elements of distance learning. They are as follows and we will be de demonstrating each of them today. Number one, live lecture. That's what we're doing here right now with one person lecturing or speaking to an entire group of people. Number two, e-learning with a student learning on an e-learning platform, learning the theory that they need to be successful in their program, but doing it online. Number three is an instructor, instructor demonstration, one to many with one instructor demonstrating a piece of equipment and a process to a whole group of students. The next item is virtual skill development with an individual learning their skills virtually online before going to the lab. Next is instructor and student interactive skills, one-to-one, -one, where an individual student interacts with an individual instructor and the student coaches the instructor through a specific skill. Number six is hands-on skill development, getting our students into the lab in a safe fashion so that they can practice their hands-on skills. And finally, portable rotational at-home skills, taking a portable trainer home so that a student can do the skill at home and then return the trainer to the school. So these are the seven elements of effective distance learning. These are what our classrooms will look like in the fall. And world-class institutions, world-class teachers, professors, and instructors will incorporate each of them into their delivery methods. So let's get started. In just a minute, you will see Evan. And I'd like to introduce you to Evan. Evan is not an actor. Evan is a real live college student, 19 years old, learning about electronic sensors. He begins by using the second element of distance learning, which is e-learning of theory incorporated in his course. Evan's instructor was able to select from 300 different four to 14 hour courses, 3000 hours of content in all, and align that content as it applied to the learning outcomes in the instructor's course. Because the e-learning platform is SCORM compliant, Evan could log on to his school's learning management system. And to him, it looked like any other course. Evan's instructor could customize the courses in just about any way he chose. And the learning management system will provide all kinds of information about Evan's performance, including what content he has completed, how he performed on the pre and post quizzes if they were used. His instructor also has access to a host of different reports on which he can rely to track Evan's progress and that of his classmates. Evan can access his e-learning from anywhere, campus, home, from work, anywhere that he can get an internet connection. It is not your grandfather's e-learning. Highly interactive, computer game level graphics, 
These are not photographs. They are computer generated interactive images. Evan won't sit for more than 20 seconds without having to interact with his e-learning platform. Definitions, interactive learning exercises, regular knowledge checks that give him the confidence that he is learning and direct him back to the content if he missed a key point. Evan's instructor can choose, as we said, from over 300 different courses in every industrial discipline under the sun. Here we will see Evan comparing large and small capacitive and inductive sensors. This is important because later today he has a virtual meeting scheduled with his instructor, Mike, where he is going to have to work with Mike virtually to adjust an inductive sensor. And Evan wants to shine when it comes to performing that skill. So the second element of distance learning is e-learning to deliver theory. Now, right about now, Evan's instructor, Mike, is getting ready to demonstrate a piece of equipment digitally. Let's assume that Mike's students are all remote today, studying from home, from work, from a computer lab on campus, from a Wi-Fi connection in the campus parking lot, or from when, wherever they do their learning. At this time, I'm gonna turn the webinar over to Mike, first to perform a virtual demonstration, and then to complete, compete, I'm sorry, complete an interactive skill with Evan. So Mike, over to you. Thank you, Matt, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm gonna be running through the next element of remote distance learning, and we're gonna be doing a, a live demo with, uh, with students and here in the lab. So before I go any further, in addition to our handheld uh, Handycam, I have just a simple HD camera set up on a tripod that is linked up through USB into my computer. So pretty easy, pretty flexible to get a bird's eye view of what's going on in the lab. The piece of equipment that we're gonna be demoing today is something we call the Skill Boss. And this is a particularly special piece of equipment because we can teach, demonstrate different skills, uh, run assessments for over 60 different uh, types of skills and technologies that's associated with this. Um, the Skill Boss is a fully functional uh, mechatronic system where we're going to be polishing these directional control valves and we're going to be sorting them based off of their material using a three axis robot that's uh, run all by pneumatic uh, circuits. So after going through proper lockout tagout uh, sequence, I'm just going to run through a quick demo of that process right now. As the part gets pushed forward, there's actually a photo eye sensor that does a quality control check to determine that the part is oriented in the correct position or not. Then as a, as if it goes through that quality check, then we're gonna go through the buffering process. And then the robot, the three axis robot is gonna come and pick that up and sort it based off of material. Now, it seems like a simple process, but there's actually a lot of different technology going on here, uh, including three different types of sensors. So the first one being that photo eye sensor that's running the quality check. We have magnetic read sensors that are determining the home and position of the three axis robot. And so we can monitor those inputs and outputs. And then we also have an inductive uh, proximity sensor that helps determine whether the part is aluminum or acrylic. So now I'm gonna work with Evan who is gonna be logging in remotely. And he's gonna actually walk me through one of the skills that he was able to practice and learn about through his e-learning. So Evan, with, if you're with me now, uh, I'm just going to cut my air, and then I want you to help, uh, if you can see the camera correctly, I want you to help me point out where is my inductive capac uh, proximity sensor. So the sensor would be right adjacent to the belt and right next to the limit switch body. All right, very good. So using your uh, skill PDF that you pulled, pulled out from the e-learning, what's my next step if I want to make adjustments to this particular sensor? So to start the adjustment process, I would first mark its current location at the top of the nut that's holding the sensor in place with the pencil. All right, that's taken care of. What's next? Then grab the two 17 millimeter wrenches and my machinist rule. All right, good to go. I'd, I'd then want to loosen both sides of the, both nuts on the sides of the slots of the sensor just enough so that I could bring it down to the bottom and begin adjusting it. All right. So I have the sensor all the way down to the bottom, loosened up, what's my next step? So now I'm gonna try and measure it out using the machinist rule. Um, 25 millimeters, I believe, would be the right measurement to sense the block. So I'm gonna go from the, the blue tip to the, the, the top of the nut and try and measure out 25 millimeters. 
All right, making that measurement now. Need a little bit more. All right, that looks good on my end. What's my next step here? So now that I've got it at the right distance, I'm gonna use my hands, take it back up to the top where I marked it with the pencil and hand tighten. All right, so while I'm doing that, Evan, what's, uh, when I'm working with inductive proximity sensors, what's one of the most important things I need to be aware of? As I just learned, uh, sensors can be very, you know, one millimeter to closer or further away can be the difference between sensing the part or not. So if we test it and it doesn't work, I would uh, open it back up, maybe, you know, move the sensor a millimeter closer, then test again until I've gotten the right distance. Awesome, very good. All right, let's see how you did. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the locking mechanism on right now, and we're gonna open our air back up, and we're gonna give it a test run. The first part that we're gonna feed through is just gonna be an acrylic part, and that's gonna be our control, we'll be able to see where the program and where the mechatronic system actually sorts the acrylic piece, and then we'll run through a metal part to see if our adjustments work well. Um, again, working with uh, proper lockout tagout procedures, giving control power, all right, here we go, Evan. This is our first plastic piece. So it looks like it passed the quality check. And when it moves forward, it's gonna sort it to the far bin. So let's see if we made a good adjustment. Here comes our next aluminum piece. All right, we'll try that one more time. So I had an alarm come through which is quite all right. So Evan, while I make an adjustment, it believes our uh, pretty simple mistake. You got to put the part in in order to move it forward. All right, let's try that one more time, Evan. Reset, here we go. All right, pass the quality check. All right, Evan, well worth the wait. So it uh, looks like you made a proper adjustment and it sorted it based into the uh, aluminum parts bin. Now, Evan, just, you know, on the off chance that, you know, we ran into a troubleshooting issue there, we were able to solve that pretty quickly. Say uh, that acrylic or that aluminum part got sorted into the far bin. What would be your first uh, step in trying to troubleshoot that issue? So my first guess would be that the sensor didn't pick it up as being aluminum, which would mean that I probably didn't bring it close enough. So I'd open it back up. Uh, do the same process of marking and bringing it back down and then moving it even closer. So maybe 26 millimeters or 27 millimeters until I get the right sensor. Awesome. Very good. Great. Well, thank you so much, Evan. And just to the, to the group watching this now, as you can see, it's a pretty easy, flexible way to still run remote lectures, remote hands-on skills, being in the lab, working with students. Um, but right now I'm going to take it over to Matt, who's going to you run it through the hybrid model that we will most likely be seeing uh, coming this fall, where we have students practicing virtual remote skills and then be able to come into the lab to work on their hands-on skills. So Matt, I'm gonna kick it back over to you. All right, well, thank you, Mike, and thank you to both you and Evan for a great demonstration. By now, our audience understands that we have reviewed the four of the seven elements of distance learning, live lecture, e-learning, instructor demonstration, and instructor slash student interactive skills on a one-to-one -one basis. Now we are going to move on to virtual skill development, which is number four on our list. Now, some would say that there's nothing quite like a hands-on skill and that there is no way to create a 100% job-ready employee or candidate without hands-on experience. I totally agree. But recall on our webinar a couple weeks ago, when we shared NASCAR driver Jimmy Johnson's observation as he observed when he was preparing for Darlington using a virtual simulator, that simulators are a really great tool from a visual aspect. He said, I would say it probably gets you 80 to 90% of the way there. Well, whether that number is 80% or 90% or 50%, the truth is, especially at a time when the number of students can gather around a hands-on trainer may be limited, Virtual skills are absolutely essential, can accelerate learning and optimize the effectiveness of precious hands-on training time. Here's how. Just taking a minute to share my screen with the audience.
And there we go. Sorry for that delay. So here we will see Evan performing a virtual skill. He's using a virtual trainer and he is connecting a uh, electric relay control circuit and you can see that this is a simple circuit. So this is a simple circuit with a single push button. He presses the push button and the red light comes on. And now he's going to remove those leads after turning off the trainer and add some leads. And this lead is going to go from the first push button to the second one, from the second one to the red light. And he turns on the trainer and we can see that this is an AND circuit. So he has to press both of those buttons in order to make it work. So here he's depressing the first one and the second one. And only when both of those are depressed, does the red light come on. Now he is going to remove those leads. And let's see if he can build a not circuit. So what we want to do and what he would be asked to do in his learning would be to build a circuit that only works or only retracts a cylinder when a button is pressed. So that button, that cylinder is going to be normally extended and it will retract when Evan wants it to retract by pressing that button. So he turns it on, we see the cylinder extend and he presses his push button and the push button retracts it. So now we know that that circuit is working exactly the way that Evan intended it to. Now that he has learned this in a virtual environment, we are going to move over to the lab. So in this case, this was an electric relay control on what trainer on which Evan could build a virtual relay control circuit. We saw him practicing and demonstrating his skills and understanding of push button switches and electrical circuits. Now we are moving on to the hands-on skills trainer. What a great example of how we can use this technology, the virtual trainer, to deliver learning in a hands-on environment. In this case, electric relay control, of course. But didn't we agree that eventually Evan needs to get into the lab? Let's see what that looks like, and we'll hand the video off to the lab where Evan is prepared to perform a hands-on skill. Here you have Evan, face mask and gloves, assuming his school requires them in this new era that we're in. And being a technical education student, Evan is accustomed to PPE, safety glasses, gloves, hearing protection when necessary. His additional PPE necessary for him to remain safe in the lab in the COVID era is just an extension of something that he was already more than used to doing. Also, the equipment on which Evan is working has been completely and effectively sanitized prior to his use of it. In our view, that step will become commonplace in the same way we wipe down equipment at the gym when we're done using it or that we perform any other SOP in manufacturing. Now let's watch as Evan completes the same skills he just performed on the virtual trainer. Note that he has reviewed the work instruction and he is building an AND circuit. And so only when he presses both buttons on his trainer does that circuit work. You'll see the small motor in the lower right hand corner of Evan's of the screen with Evan starting and stopping as Evan controls his circuit. Now Evan is going to build another circuit. He turns off his trainer and he is removing his leads and he's going to look at his work instruction and I believe he's going to build the not circuit that we just saw. And if that circuit when Evan is completed with it is working properly, what we should see is that motor will stop when Evan depresses the button and run when the controller and when the trainer is otherwise energized. So let's watch Evan build that circuit. And as we can see, the controller is energized and the motor is running. And when Evan depresses the button, the motor stops working. So his not, not circuit is working exactly as he intended, exactly as he practiced when he was on his virtual learning. So now on to our final element of distance learning. As Evan puts away his trainer, the final element of distance learning is rotational hands-on skills using authentic training technology. In this case, Evan checks out a hands-on trainer from his college. These trainers are fully portable and can be used by Evan at home or at work. For the most part, every major training system from ACDC to mechanical drives to fluid power, process control, PLCs, and so on is available in a portable version. Once Evan is done using the trainer, he brings it back to school where it is sanitized and made available for the next student. So let's review quickly the seven elements of distance learning that Evan and Mike have demonstrated for us. Number one, live lecture. That was where I talked one to many using a Zoom platform or another webinar platform to deliver the live lecture. Number two is e-learning, where we have a student learning online in an online environment, learning the theory that's important for the program that he or she is in. Next, the instructor demonstration, one to many, 
for an individual instructor is demonstrating to many students at one time. That's what we saw Mike doing with the skill boss. On to virtual skill development, where Evan learned his virtual skill using the virtual trainer, the electric relay control trainer in that case, and gave him an opportunity to fine tune his skills in that environment. Next was the instructor student interactive skill, one to one, where Mike and Evan worked together to adjust that sensor and make sure that the product was working exactly and the system was working exactly as it was intended before they moved on. The next item was hands on skills, where Evan went into the lab and in a safe fashion worked very closely with a trainer to exhibit the fact that he could do his hands on skill on a hands on trainer. And finally, portable rotational at home skills, where Evan took the opportunity to pick up the trainer at school, take it to his house, learn, and then take it back to the school so that it could be sanitized and moved on to the next student. So my friends, today we end where we began. None of us knows exactly what technical education will look like in the fall, but we can be assured that it will be different than what it was in March. By equipping themselves and their programs with the right AV technology, e-learning simulation, virtual skills, hands-on skills in the lab and at home, our instructors and teachers will be able to continue to do what they have always done, to instruct students, to instill valuable skills, to prepare them for the workplace, inspire them to do more, to be more, and to achieve more than the student alone ever thought possible. In short, they will secure the American dream for the next generation. And in the end, isn't that what technical education is all about?